Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing. And tonight we are going to be reading another bit of Moby Dick. So, let's get cracking. Chapter 50 Ahab's Boat and Crew Fadala. Who would have thought it, Flask? cried Stubb. If I had but one leg you would not catch me in a boat, unless maybe to stop the plug hole with my timber toe. Oh, he's a wonderful old man. I don't think it's so strange after all. On that account, said Flask. If his leg were off at the hip, now it would be a different thing. That would disable him. But he has one knee, and good part of the other left, you know. I don't know that, my little man. I never yet saw him kneel. Among whale-wise people, it has often been argued whether, considering the paramount importance of his life to the success of the voyage, it is right for a whaling captain to jeopardise that life in the active perils of the chase. So T Tamerlane's soldiers often argued with tears in their eyes whether that invaluable life of his ought to be carried into the thickest of the fight. But with Ahab the question assumed a modified aspect. Considering that with two legs man is but a hobbling white in all times of danger, considering that the pursuit of whales is always under great and extraordinary difficulties, at every individual moment indeed, then comprises a peril under these circumstances, is it wise for any maimed man to enter a whale boat in the hunt? As a general thing, the joint owners of the Pequod must have plainly thought not. Ahab well knew that although his friends at home would think little of his ent entering a boat in certain comparatively harmless vicissitudes of the chase, for the sake of being near the scene of action and giving his orders in person, yet for Captain Ahab to have a boat actually apportioned to him as a regular headsman in the hunt, above all for Captain Ahab to be supplied with five extra men as that same boat's crew, he well knew that such generous conceits never entered the heads of the owners of the Pequot. Therefore he had not solicited a boat's crew from them, nor had he in any way hinted his desires on that head. Nevertheless, he had taken private measures of his own touching all that matter. Until Cabaco's published discovery, the sailors had little foreseen it, though to be sure when, after even after being a little white while out of port, all hands had concluded the customary business of fitting the whaleboats for service. When some time after this, Ahab was now and then found bestirring himself in the matter of making tholepins with his own hands for what was thought to be one of the spare boats, and even solicitously cutting the small wooden skewers, which, when the line is running out, are pinned over the groove in the bow. When all this was observed in him, and particularly his solicitude in having an extra coat of sheathing in the bottom of the boat, as if to make it better withstand the pointed pressure of his ivory limb, and also the anxiety, anxiety he evinced in exactly shaping the thighboard, or clumsy cleat, as it is sometimes called, the horizontal piece in the boat's bow for bracing the knee against in darting or stabbing at the whale. When it was observed how often he stood up in that boat with his solitary knee fixed in the semicircular depression in the cleat, and with the carpenter's chis chisel gouged out a little here and straightened it a little there. All these things, I say, had awakened much interest and curiosity at the time, but almost everybody supposed that this particular pre preparative heedfulness in Ahab must only be with a view to the ultimate chase of Moby Dick, for he had already revealed his intention to hunt that mortal monster in person. But su such a supposition did by no means involve the remotest suspicion as to any boat's crew being assigned to that boat. Now, with the subordinate phantoms, what wonder remained, so remained soon waned away, for in a whaler wonders soon wane. Besides, now and then such unaccountable odds and ends of strange nations come up from the unknown nooks and ash holes of the earth to man these floating outlaws of whalers, and the ships themselves often pick up such queer castaway creatures found tossing about the open sea on planks, bits of wreck, oars, whaleboats, canoes, blown off Japanese junks and what not, that Beelzebub himself might climb up the side and step down into the cabin to chat with the captain, and it would not create an un subduable excitement in the forecastle. But, be all this as it may, 
Certain it is that while the subordinate phantoms soon found their place among the crew, though still as it were somehow distinct from them, yet that hair-turbaned Fidala remained a muffled mystery to the last. Whence he came in a mannerly world like this, by what sort of unaccountable tie he soon ev evinced himself to be linked with Ahab's peculiar fortunes, nay, so far as to have some sort of a half-hinted influence, heaven knows, but it might have been even authority over him. All this none knew. But one cannot sustain an indifferent air concerning Fadala. He was such a creature as civilised, domestic people in the temperate zone only see in their dreams, and that but dimly, but the like of whom now and then glide among the unchanging Asiatic communities, especially the Oriental Isles to the east of the continent. Those insulated, immemorial, unalterable countries, which, even in these modern days, still preserve much of the ghostly aboriginalness of Earth's primal generations, when the memory of the first man was a distinct recollection, and all men his descendants, unknowing whence he came, eyed each other as real phantoms, and asked of the sun and the moon why they were created, and to what end. When, though, according to Genesis, the angels indeed consorted with the daughters of men, the devils also, add the uncanonical rabbins, indulged in mundane armours. Amours, sorry. Chapter 51. The Spirit Spout. Days, weeks passed, and under easy sail, the ivory Pequod had slowly swept across four several cruising grounds, that off the off the Azores, off the Cape de Verdes, on the plate, so called, being off the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, and the Carroll ground, an unstaked watery locality, southerly from St. Hel Helena. It was while gliding through these latter waters that one serene and moonlit night, when all the waves rolled by like scrolls of silver, and by their soft suffusing seethings made what seemed a silvery silence, not a solitude. On such a silent night a silvery jet was seen far in advance of the white bubbles at the bow, lit up by the moon. It looked celestial. Seemed some plumed and glittering god uprising from the sea. For Dalla first described this jet. For of those moonlight nights it was his wont to mount to the main masthead and stand a lookout there, with the same precision as if it had been day. And yet, though herds of whales were seen by night, not one whaleman in a hundred would venture a lowering for them. You may think with what emotions, then, the seamen beheld this old oriental perched aloft at such unusual hours. His turban and the moon, companions in one sky. But when, after spending his uniform se interval there for several successive nights without uttering a single sound, when, after all this silence, his unearthly voice was heard announcing that silvery moonlit jet, every reclining mariner started to his feet as if some winged spirit had lighted in the rigging and hailed the mortal crew. There she blows, had the trump of judgment blown. They could not have quivered more, yet still they felt no terror, rather pleasure. For though it was a most unwanted hour, yet so impressive was the cry, and so deliriously exciting, that almost every soul on board instinctively desired a lowering. Walking the deck with a quick side-lunging strides, Ahab commanded the to-gallant sails and royals to be set, and every stun sail spread. The best man in the ship must take the helm. Then, with every masthead manned, the piled-up craft rolled down before the wind. The strange upheaving, lifting tendency of the tail taffrail breeze filling the hollows of so many sails, made the buoyant, hovering deck to feel like air beneath the feet. While still she rushed along, as if two antagonistic influences were struggling in her, one to mount direct to heaven, the other to drive yawingly to some horizontal goal. And had you watched Ahab's face that night, you would have thought that in him also two different things were warring. While his one live leg made lively echoes along the deck, Every stroke of his dead limb sounded like a coffin tap. On life and death this old man walked. But though the ship so swiftly sped, and th though from every eye, like arrows, the eager glances shot, yet the silvery jet was no more seen 
that night. Every sailor swore he saw it once, but not a second time. This midnight spout had almost grown a forgotten thing, when some days after, lo, at the same silent hour, it was again announced. Again it was descried by all, but upon making sail to overtake it, once more it disappeared as if it had never been, and so it served us night after night, till no one heeded it but to wonder at all. To wonder at it, sorry. Mysteriously jetted into the clear moonlight, or starlight, as the case might be, disappearing again for one whole day, or two days, or three, and somehow seeming at every distinct repetition to be advancing still further and further in our van, this solitary jet seemed forever alluring us on. And with that, we're going to end there, because there is another... I don't actually know how many more pages to this one, but I know there is at least ten. So, we're going to end the episode here. I'm going to say thank you very much for joining me. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night, no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye. <laughs>